Welcome back for another episode of LMU History Department's Summer Web Social Media Series, Viral Histories. A couple of weeks ago, Professor Meng Zhang spoke about wet, wet markets and wild animals, and today I'm joined by Professor Amy Woodson Bolton for a discussion of COVID, wild animals, and environmental history, or when humans meet nature. Professor Woodson Bolton is Associate Professor of British and Irish History and past chair of the Department of History. Her research focuses on the, trans, uh, the social role of art and nature in industrial capitalist society. Her first book was Transformative Beauty, uh, Art Museums in Industrial Britain, and her current project explores the history of anthropology and anthropological understandings of art and indigenous material culture. Welcome, Amy. Thank you, I'm so excited to be here. So in recent years, uh, you've uh, started to develop courses in environmental history. Uh, and the title of this presentation connects COVID to wild animals and environmental history. So what do you see as the connection between these? Well, as uh, Professor Zhang pointed out in her uh, viral histories video, um, there's been a lot of talk about the origins of COVID in relation to wild animals and this idea of the wet market, which is, as she talked about, a farmer's market. Um, and I am really interested in this idea of when humans meet wild animals, those interfaces, uh, many environmental historians and those who are interested in environmental policy now talk about urban wild interfaces. And one of the most interesting things for me about COVID is how we talk about it and how it relates to other environmental crises that we're facing like climate change. So for instance, wildfires often now happen in urban wild interfaces. And these are spaces that maybe we think of as ex-urban, where the cost of living in urban uh, centers has gotten so high, people are moving out of the suburbs and closer and closer to, um, to wildlands. It was interesting actually recently because of the lockdowns, seeing wild animals or animals that we would think of as wild animals, right? Um, in urban spaces. So you saw streets in, in Australia and in Wales, uh, in the United Kingdom, um, in New York, in Los Angeles, all over the world where suddenly there were animals that we don't usually see um, in those spaces. But this also brings up the kind of question to me of like, what constitutes a wild animal? Um, so what wild animals live around the viewers, wherever they happen to be around us here in Los Angeles? Um, I'm really interested in even the virus as a wild creature that we have now come into contact with. Um, a lot of our conservation efforts have been around what environmentalists call charismatic megafauna. Those are the uh, the zebras, the lions, the giraffes, the elephants, right, that we see campaigns around. Um, and those animals that kind of have entered our collective imaginations through storybooks, through zoos, uh, through toys and conservation campaigns. Um, so, you know, all of these issues for me are things that get raised in this question about COVID and wild animals and environmental history. So this seems um, also to be some of what you're indicating in the second part of your, your title. Um, can you say a bit about why you put nature in, in scare quotes and quotation marks? Yeah, so um, as you know, one of the things that I do in my environmental history classes is I really want my students to think about what the idea of nature is, to not take that as a given. And as we as historians, like to do with everything, right? We want to show that everything has a history, including concepts like nature. Now, funnily enough, the phrase that we use for this is that a concept gets naturalized so that it seems like something that has always been, that's just, can, that is just there with us um, and that we don't have control over. But I'm really interested in the idea of nature as a cultural construct. And one of the things that this kind of helps us understand is the way that different human societies relate to nature can be very different, changes according to society, and changes over time. Um, one of the things the virus kind of raises is, you know, is, is a virus, I mean, obviously a virus is part of nature, but, and yet we don't really think about it in those terms. We don't think of a virus as natural in the same way. 
Um, likewise, the question of wilderness is something that has certainly changed over time. Um, sometimes, you know, when we're going camping, let's say, or we're going to visit um, a national park, we think of that wildness as beautiful and good, but the virus seems to be everything that's scary to us about nature, um, as pest, as vermin. Um, and again, this kind of, it brings up the issue of how we relate to nature as an idea, as a cultural construct. Uh, on behalf of the American Historical Association, I am going to thank you for including their hashtag in your yes. answer, everything has a history. And of course, everything does have a history. Um, you've been focusing, as you've talked about already, on environmental history. Can you give us some examples of how environmental history can help us think about these questions? You know, how have different societies thought about nature at different times? Yeah, so I mean, one of the ways that teaching environmental history has helped me think about this is of course that there are many ways of answering that question. Um, but for me, one of the most important things that we can do is understand economic history and environmental history as two sides of the same coin, right? So often if we're not using an environmental historical lens, we will teach uh, sorry, economic history as a history of resources, a history of trade, um, a history of the way that different societies maybe exchange goods or the meaning or value that they give to them. But when we think about this from an environmental point of view, we're thinking about the environmental impacts of those, but also the way that different societies think about natural resources and to understand that all economic questions are also environmental questions. Um, pretty much all human societies have had to think about how to survive and to thrive, right? They need food, they need water, they need air, they need shelter, but those things change over time. Um, you know, one of the things that happened, and here's kind of a, a good clear example, and it's fascinating to me as somebody who studies British and imperial history, is that we really see a shift in thinking about nature right at the time of the Industrial Revolution. So for us, and this very much translates into North American culture, including the United States, um, ideas about nature tend to be very sentimental and really shift with the Romantic movement. And I always say to my students, it's always fascinating to me that right at the moment where increasing numbers of people were moving into what we understand as a middle class, they had access to food, they had access to shelter, they were often living in cities, that's when we start to see these major movements to romanticize nature, to sentimentalize it, to go visit it. And I always think about the poets Wordsworth and Coleridge who wrote so many poems that shape our thinking about nature who would go off and tramp around uh, the Lake District in England and then come home and sleep in a very nice, comfortable bed. So, you know, I think a lot of these shifts are, you know, that's one way of thinking about that kind of shift. Um, another example kind of on the other side from earlier though, is the way that, uh, you know, when Europeans first encountered the new world, we really see, uh, Europeans imagining North America and, and uh, Central America as empty, right? This idea of a wilderness that is just right for exploitation. We see that framing, we see Europeans repeat that framing of empty land or land that is uncultivated, unexploited, as, and, and ripe for colonization over and over again in the Americas and of course later in Africa and the South Pacific and elsewhere. Um, you know, one of the things I think that, um, you know, again, we, this is really pertinent to this moment of, of pandemic is to think about the Colombian exchange. So another example of how environmental history connects to these ideas, um, the fact that disease exchanges have been so unequal and have had such devastating consequences, particularly in the Americas, um, so one thing that just recently scientists have started to really understand is that the reforestation in the new world came about due to the devastating impacts of smallpox and that that reforestation actually contributed to the Little Ice Age, um, which was a global climatic event. 
uh, from about 1550 to 1750. Um, so those are some examples of kind of ways of thinking about a global environmental history around concepts of nature, of economics, of disease, uh, and other kinds of exchanges. Uh, you've talked here um, about the idea of um, the exploitation of resources uh, and the re human relationship to nature, often as one of, of exploitation. When did, uh, quote unquote, wilderness and wild animals become something more positive, something to conserve and save? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that's really fascinating is that the roman that romantic impulse uh, towards nature uh, often really got turned into policy later on in the 19th century. And actually, and this is, uh, this will be a little personal anecdote about my own relationship to environmental history. I was fortunate enough as an undergraduate to study with an environmental historian named Carolyn Merchant. And it was for her environmental studies class that I first did my very own historical research paper. And our students and other faculty and those listening will understand the thrill of original archival research. And so for that first, my first undergraduate real research paper, I was looking at um, the way that uh, train companies constructed the narrative about national parks. And I was fascinated and I was able to look at the original brochures and promotional materials uh, for Yellowstone and for other early 19th century national parks. So one of the things that is just so interesting is the way that wilderness as something to conserve and save went along with the new industrial economy um, as places of leisure, as places of consumption, places connected by uh, these new, by railroads, right? Um, but also, and this is comes out from my more recent research and uh, other work, work that scholars are doing on the British Empire, some of the first reserves in Africa were game preserves. And that really came out of after the British had hunted species nearly to extinction. So they were interested in preserving the game for their own hunting as much, and certainly more than any kind of ecological concern for preserving habitats the way we would think about it now. Um, so there's this really interesting kind of relationship to this, the concept of what uh, environmental historians refer to as pristine wilderness, right? This idea of like wilderness untouched by humans um, and urbanization, industrialization, capitalism, imperialism, all of these things really move together. And I think it's worth also worth remembering that you know, again, as we talked about that, that European concept of wilderness being empty of people, often that was a very imaginary emptiness, right? These were often lands that were full of people. They were full of indigenous people. They were full of societies. They were full of humans who had lived in these spaces for a very long time, who suddenly didn't fit the picture of this, uh, of a nature that was totally separate from human cultivation. Um, some very famous examples, of course, are when the um, uh, peoples who lived in Yosemite Valley had to be moved out, right? And to me, one of the greatest tragedies is that often the members uh, of those tribes came back and worked in the hotels as staff, which to me is just one of the most heartbreaking kind of uh, stories of loss, I think, that, that we can imagine. Um, and of course, the relationship to uh, preserved lands and indigenous peoples now is incredibly complicated, questions over hunting rights. I mean, this goes all the way from people living in the tundra who conduct whale hunts in traditional ways to people wanting to hunt or to have cattle uh, in African game preserves. So again, a kind of um, this a desire to have a kind of on the Euro part of Europeans and North Americans to have uh, spaces for that they imagine as empty of humans, um, often except themselves, who are now coming for aesthetic reasons or for hunting reasons or for reasons of leisure, has absolutely collided in very violent ways with those peoples who were in fact living in those spaces. 
So picking up on that, and you also mentioned your current research project, um, how did um, some of these romantic ideas about nature relate to other ideas about the so-called primitive societies who supposedly lived closer to nature? Yeah, so in my latest research, I'm working on this uh, idea of so-called primitive art. And um, this is a, a fascinating subject and, and many people have studied it from many different angles. But the thing I'm really interested in is how anthropologists and their work related to other conversations about art in the 19th and 20th centuries. And in this case, um, in, the, in the British context in particular, and very much because of the pressures of industrialization and uh, imperialism, there, was, there were whole debates about kind of art needing to be to, to represent truth to nature, as John Ruskin used to write. Um, and many of those ideas, I think, relate in very fascinating ways within the way that anthropologists, uh, for example, um, August Augustus Henry Lane Fox Pitt Rivers, the man with a very long name, who founded the Pitt Rivers Museum, started organizing their collections of indigenous material culture to show, or to, to prove, as they thought, um, an evolution, a socio-cultural evolution. And in these kinds of displays, they imagined that the earliest tools or art forms or weapons uh, always were the ones closest to nature. They showed the least um, human intervention. And one of the things that's so crucial about this kind of thinking about in contemporary, that is 19th century non-European peoples who were understood to be modern savages, often this kind of way of framing these primitive peoples, is that they lived closer to nature. And in fact, farther back in time, they represented for these 19th century anthropologists, they represented European prehistory. And so you could trace the way the Europeans thought of it, the prehistory of art in their own artifacts. Um, this became, uh, a, you know, the kind of way of thinking so that any indigenous material artifact was framed in terms of a ritual purpose, a functional purpose, uh, a weapon, um, never as an aesthetic statement of its own, and always very much in terms of uh, European art. Um, and so this is kind of, this is what I've been, been working with, but I think what's so fascinating is the way you can see it, how it relates to, at the same time, the European emphasis in the world's fairs, in uh, imperialism in the colonies on exploiting natural resources of those, often those very same peoples. Yeah, fa fascinating, uh, and it's a great project. Uh, so where does this leave us, thinking about nature and wilderness now? Well, this is such a hard question. I mean, one of the things that uh, my students and I have really grappled with in environmental history is, re okay, if we recognize that nature is a construct and that the environment is also a very recent idea as something that we need to save, um, that wilderness, there is a reality to um, the concept of what uh, one historian calls the last reserves, that is that um, humans really have pushed uh, wilderness further and further into wilderness, right? That goes back to those urban wild interfaces that we were talking about at the beginning. Um, so there is, there's, there is truly a new a qualitative difference in how humans are affecting the global environment, and this is real. Um, at the same time, we uh, want to kind of understand that our uh, individual actions do make a difference, right? That we can, we can make choices, but we also need to recognize that often this is going to take really systemic uh, action, right? To face these really much bigger questions. Um, population growth is real, urbanization is real, the trade in exotic wild species is real, obviously climate change is real. There's a real increase that is on previously non-cultivated areas, areas that were not previously inhabited by humans. And COVID is a perfect example of that, as are SARS and AIDS and H1N1, right? These sorts of interfaces with uh, wild spaces. And 
I recently read that uh, scientists estimate there's something like 40,000 novel viruses living in animal populations now that we, again, just like the novel coronavirus, we have not been exposed to. So there's a real question in terms of public health in terms of how we relate to these wild spaces. Um, as we manage climate change, we are facing many questions here in California about these sorts of urban wild interfaces, for instance, about wildfires. How do we make the electrical grid safe, for instance? How do we manage fire control? Are we using, for example, prison populations to put out wildfires? Are we using them to put out wildfires uh, to protect property? Or are we using them for, to protect natural resources? So there are really very important questions of justice. Who is being affected? Who's being used as labor, et cetera? Um, one writer, Emma Maris, talks about, she talks about kind of where this leaves us thinking about nature or wilderness now as what she calls a menu of new goals. So kind of being aware of the choices that we're making and kind of recognizing we are not going to be able to get Australia to look like it was before Captain Cook arrived, right? We're not going to be able to uh, really get these sorts of, if our idea of a baseline pristine wilderness is before colonization, before globalization, before the kind of interchange that we now have in the world, that is going to be incredibly costly and we're going to have to really decide where to put our resources. On the other hand, are we willing to accept the extinction, the mass extinction that we're facing? Who are we going to save? And we really are kind of reaching a Noah's Ark moment. Um, and I think it's important to be honest about that. We are going to need to make choices. One of the things that being aware about of the uh, kind of romantic and sentimental and historical roots of concepts like nature and conservation is that we are making, we need to know why we're making the choices we make. Are we making choices because an elephant is cute, right? Like why, who are we benefiting if we do it? And, and again, who are we privileging? If we say certain charismatic me megafauna have to live, are we then dooming other humans, uh, populations to poverty and potentially death from uh, incredibly uh, difficult climactic changes? How are we gonna deal with migrant populations caused by uh, climate change? Are we gonna prioritize saving cute animals over welcoming in new citizens because they have to escape uh, the terrible effects of climate change that they did not create? So these are kind of some of the choices, but I think also when you frame these questions historically, you really start to see the origins of the power differentials the severely racialized nature of those power differentials, the legacies of imperialism, and the legacies of these ideas, right? So that it doesn't, you know, again, hopefully we do make choices collectively that prioritize all life, including animal life and human life, but that we're aware of how and why we're making those choices. Um, and again, of course, there are no easy answers, unfortunately. Um, the one hope I think is that, the, that COVID might have, hopefully will lead us to think about these questions differently, to, to start to take collective action um, and to realize that COVID is actually part of a broader question about taking care of our resources on a planetary scale, thinking about our kind of overall global urban wild interface and thinking of course about the implications of climate change. Thank you. You, you mentioned um, climate migrants and for people who are interested in that uh, topic uh, and looking into it in more depth, there was not this past Sunday, but the Sunday before the New York Times Magazine had a big story about climate migration. That's very interesting. Yeah, and ProPublica recently did a really amazing piece as well. It that it was in partnership, the two of them. Right. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. then we'll yeah. probably it's talk the same, about the same. It's the same piece. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we were just coming at it from two different angles. Um, so thanks so much, Amy, for a very interesting discussion, and I'm sure that you'll be exploring um, these issues and more in your honors classes uh, this semester. Thanks I again. Will, absolutely. Thanks so much. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. 
Um, our final episode is next week with our new historian of Africa, Devin Goloshevsky, who will be talking about quarantine in colonial Senegal. Hope to see you there. And in the interim, keep wearing your mask. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>